Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's in My Head podcast today. I'm joined by Peter, the creator of Cat Dog. Peter, how are you, sir? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. Uh, usually at this point in the time in the interview, I would say, hey, when did you get into art? Or when did you know that drawing was your thing? However, with the many interviews I've had with some of the creators on there, I've heard a lot of stories about what people can and cannot put in shows. And I want to ask, what was what was the overall feeling or what looks did you get when you said, I want to put a cat and a dog, make them conjoin twins. I want to make this into a TV show at Nickelodeon. And the only reason I asked that is because I've had David Feist, Cowan Chicken, and both Craig McCracken on for Powerpuff mm -hmm. Girls. And they both said they couldn't call their people the devil, right? Him from Powerpuff Girls was supposed to be the devil. Right. Um, and the red guy from Cowan Chicken was right. the devil. Uh, right. But they couldn't call him that. I got to imagine that conjoined feline and canine might have mm -hmm. turned some heads at Nickelodeon back in the day. Well, you know, weirdly, I mean, I've told this story before, but um, we didn't, there was never really that kind of controversy about it because um, I got contacted by Nickelodeon because of some kids' books that I did and other illustrations and other stuff that I had done um, in my career. And uh, and I got hired to make three short films. Um, and they had me pitch what those films would be. There are going to be three short films all based on one character, a set of characters, or whatever. So I gave them kind of 10 ideas. And one of them was this thing called Cat Dog. You know? mm -hmm. um, so they fell in love with it. In terms of Nickelodeon, they fell in love with it right off the bat. There was no, there was no meeting where I had to defend people saying, what the hell are you talking about? Because it was more like, that's the one they chose out of 10 ideas. You know? Yeah. But then once I started working on that, I lived in Chicago at the time, and I was uh, uh, I started working on these three little short stories that we're going to animate. Um, but in the middle of that, I started this this cat dog theme song sort of sort of running in my head. I just started singing it to myself. Sort of, you know? yeah. um, so then I recorded a little version of that with my guitar and my little you know laptop back then. So this is like you know 22 years ago, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I sent it off to Nickelodeon, and then it. Within Nickelodeon, it sort of became a little bit viral. I think I sent it to the person I was working with. There was a little department in Nickelodeon called the Creative Lab back then, and the Creative Lab was like a little incubator for new, weirder, newer ideas. You know, so they chose they chose Cat Dog. Then I started working on it. Then I wrote the theme song, and then that theme song kind of made the rounds around the building in New York, in, you know, the Nickelodeon building. And then the president of Nickelodeon at the time called me on the phone and sang the song to me, and said and said, you know, I have good news and bad news. The bad news is we don't want to make those three short films anymore. We want to make a pilot and try to make a TV series. So in other words, I didn't even pitch it as a, as a half hour TV series. I pitched it as three, you know, one and a half minute movies. So there was never a point where anybody really said, are you out of your mind? Of course, we would never do that. They were asking me, you know what I mean? At that point, they were asking me for it. So so that's, it was kind of a neat, it was, well, first of all, it was the easiest pitch in history because of the way it sort of unfolded without really uh, exactly trying, but also that whole issue of whether it was perverse or, you know, controversial never really came up because it was that what they, they chose. I mean, they chose it out of this list of other ideas. So, so yeah. what was that feeling like when you get that phone call? Not only is the president of Nickelodeon singing the song you came up with, the song that was yeah. bounced around in your noggin that you put yeah. on paper and then you put put some music to it. Yeah. What was what was going through your head when you hear this? Not only is he singing to you, but he's like, hey, man, I want to pick this show up. Yeah, it's really I mean, it's, it's a crazy, fun moment. You know, it's like this kind of thing where, you know, people always talk about when they get calls from not that the president of Nickelodeon is like getting a call from. You know, a super famous person, but people are kind of uh, in disbelief at first when you're hearing this. Like, what are you are you pranking me? Kind of feeling, you know. Um, but no, it's got he was super friendly on the phone. It was like a totally normal conversation where you're having this thing and he's singing the song, and then he's telling me about making a pilot and all this kind of stuff. And I'll have to go to California to do that, and da blah blah blah. And then you get off the phone and you go like. Did that just happen? You know what I mean? Like that's, that's the kind of feeling you have. Like, I was like, did I just dream that? Because it, it's, it seemed to go so well compared to most of the phone calls I have in my life. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so it's definitely a, a very fun, I mean, you know, it was a very euphoric moment and uh, a great thing to do. Like the whole process of going from, you know, uh, this is going to be a tiny little uh, project that's going to you know, be off my desk in a couple of months to, you know, 
years of my life and moving my family and all that kind of stuff, all that's, it was a, a major, major, you know, momentous occurrence in my life that just was, you know, like a roller coaster of fun, you know, it was difficult, but fun. It's, as you know, as you said before, and you're going to bring this up, some, some uh, brains were splattered on the ceiling in the making of cat dog, but mostly for me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, uh, when, when you get off that call, you obviously say, oh, man, was that real? Was it fake? You said 22 years ago was when that phone call happened? Yeah, I, I, may, uh, I didn't really do the math, but it's something like uh, probably maybe 24, actually. I think yeah. it, was probably, it was about 2000, it was, it was uh, 1996. 96, 97, yes, 25 years ago, man. Uh, that shit is wild. Like, so when you get off that phone call, do you look at your, do you look at your spouse and go, Hey, uh, we got to go to LA now. Are you originally from Chicago? Before we get to that question, are you originally from Chicago? I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, actually on the Erie canal called Newark, New York, like Newark, New Jersey. But, you know, yeah. Small, like 12,000 people. And then, uh, and then I went, you know, I went to school somewhere else and then I went to live in San Francisco for a little bit and then I moved to Chicago. So, but I lived in Chicago for a long time before I came. That's, that's, it's wild. I've only been to Chicago once. I went to, I went to the Great Lakes for about six to eight weeks for Navy boot camp. The oh, yeah. coldest, coldest I have ever been in my life, Peter. We went in February, right? So I leave Florida. Beautiful yeah. during February. It's like shorts weather in February. You might have yeah. a hoodie on and maybe a beanie and you got shorts on, right? And we wear flip flops year round. Yeah. So me being me, I show up in a very thin pair of jeans and yeah. I had to borrow my uh, father-in-law's jacket because I had hoodies. I didn't have jackets. They're from Massachusetts. I'm from Florida. So they know about this shit. Right, right. So we get off the plane and I have never in my life seen snow. There was snow. I'm six foot two. I have yeah. never seen snow halfway up my body before. Yeah. And then people are just conversing and walking around like nothing, you know, I think that's normal. It was negative 22 degrees with the wind chill. Yeah, I can't fucking ridiculous peter is what i'm getting i was so miserable and then six weeks and here's what they don't tell you when you're a southern guy and you go to boot camp the first people they try to get on snow watch which means you have to go out there and shovel snow are the guys from the south <laughs> so so you go and you tell tell, tell uh what's your wife's name by the way and it was drew dru drew so when you go say hey drew we're uh moving to california what was that like? I mean, did she believe you? Did she think you were playing around or? Yeah, well, for, at first it was, you know, that first uh, brush is more of kind of like, I'm going to California to make a pilot. And then after, when we see what happens with the pilot, then we are moving to California. So there was a little bit of a buffer. It wasn't like a, we're, we're not leaving in a week. It's more like, it's going to be months and months before we actually have to face the fact that we're going to move to California. But, um, you know, I had little kids at the time. So it was, you know, it's always hard to uproot. But it's kind of like a thing when you get a TV show or you get something that's a big momentous thing like that. It's kind of a nice big bandaid on the on the issue yeah. of having to move. So it's kind of because it's it's fun for everybody, especially when it's cartoons. Like you know, the kids aren't going. You know, it's not like you're being dragged off because your dad got a job selling insurance in California. It's like a <laughs> totally, totally different occurrence. So yeah, so mostly everybody was pretty happy about it. You know, but it's hard. You know, it's always hard to move, but um, but mostly was happy. Yeah, so. Um, That's cool, man. Uh, so, so you get out to California and you're working on this pilot. You remember how long it took you to, to put the pilot up so they can see it? You know, it's, I'm afraid you're going to ask me that. I think probably, <laughs> probably, uh, five, probably five or six months, something like that. I mean, I think, you know, uh, writing, boarding, and then getting an animated. There's a, there's a gap in between doing all that and getting an animated, obviously. So it was probably, it was probably five months or something like that before. We were done. I think I actually like. I'm so bad. Like, this is a question. Like, when you asked that question, I was like, I have no idea. I can't remember. It. In fact, <laughs> in fact, my memory of all that time was so is so uh, such a through a filter of you know strangeness. Like the idea of moving to a new place is always hard. But like, I had I look back on that period, and some of it felt so unreal to me. I think it's partly that partly that idea of moving from someplace like Chicago, where you know. Where you have to live through those, those brutal winters and all of a sudden me being out there in the middle of january and february and my family being back there shoveling and i'm in this place that's like you know paradise and it's like you know it's just weird you know so it's a very it's very disorienting in every in every way you know but the combination of the weather and the it feels more like time travel than just travel in a certain way you know so um anyway you know, it's, yeah I, I can only imagine man I've, I've been all over this country i've lived in washington state and san diego and virginia and, and now i'm back in florida 
Um, so it, it's dip, it's weird when you go to different places at the same time of the year, and then you look yeah. back and like, holy shit, man, it's it's beautiful there. It's freezing here. Or it's raining there, but it's dry here. It, it's it's wild, right? But uh, so you're in California. I try to stay away from those type of questions, like when'd you write this? When'd you have this idea? Because like I said, we're talking 25 years ago. I can't remember six months ago, let alone you know, 25 years ago. Um, but nonetheless, I, I I just I don't know why I asked that question. But here we are. No uh, so when you get out there or when you got this show going on, you got cat dog kicking around in your head. Um, you, you said you wrote the song first. So obviously music plays a huge role in, in everything you do. And we have a question about that. We'll get to that in just a little bit. Um, but when you're writing this show, you obviously had the, the theme song already done or yeah. you know, flushed out at least. Yeah. Uh, do you have voices on the characters of who, who or what they would sound like or Obviously, we got Jim and we had Tom as the the, the two. Um, but did you know who or what they wanted to sound like as far as kind of? Really. It kind of was. It was more. You know, during the process of writing the pilot, it was becoming clearer and clearer who they needed to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had, I had the basic personalities of the of the uh, the main characters worked out in terms of how what the dynamic was between cat and dog. That the dog was you know pure id and crazy and wild and happy as hell and the cat was kind of like you know the pilot is really about how cat really doesn't want to be a part of cat dog it's like yeah. it's like if i had my druthers i could hide you i could hide my butt forever and just pretend <laughs> that i'm by myself so that's the di that's the basic dynamic always is that he's like how did this happen to me like why me like and meanwhile dog is like this is the best thing ever you know so um, but and that was kind of figured out. But then, as we, as we, you know, uh, different characters came in, and you know, Rancid Rabbit was pretty clear because he was, he's sort of an art, art typical villain who has many different jobs, like an officious sort of, you know, guy. Uh, Winslow was the one who's. I actually thought about this years ago. That it was really funny when I first drew Winslow, who was, you know, a complete pain in the ass shit disturber. When I first drew him, I was thinking that he was going to be a really sweet guy, really yeah. sweet character. It's fun. Not sure why that was, but then when we started thinking about it, we were thinking like, you know, the more you look at this guy, his personality, just from the few drawings I'd done of him, we started to realize, you know, looking at him, that he's not sweet at all. He's like a real, he's an asshole. So we've got to figure out a way he is an asshole. So that, and so he's the one that really, in terms of the main, you know, main characters, he's the one that was the most unclear when I started. And then it became very clear once, once you started thinking about what he was going to sound like, we gave him a, a kind of a Brooklyn accent and a, you know a real uh, attitude yeah. and he, clearer and clearer it's it's an interesting thing the whole thing of casting you know because uh, sometimes you have a clear idea and then other times you don't and it's you have to figure it out as you go along and sometimes you think you have a really clear idea and then somebody comes in with an idea of, that kind of blows your original idea out, out of the water you just kind of have to learn to, to roll with it one of the things about animation or filmmaking in general is that it's so collaborative that it's really good and important to let other people's ideas in. Yeah. So you gotta kind of be really receptive to different ways of doing things and stuff like that. And there are many, many times where, you know, you think you have an idea what something should be and they go like, you know, more I think about it, maybe we should go this way. So you, you gotta be open to it. Yeah. Now, when, when this is going on, who are you leaning on the most as far as like, hey, if you're if you're feeling stressed and I want to talk about, you know, your family, because obviously, like, I'll tell my wife almost anything. If I'm feeling stressed, she's generally the first person I go to. Um, but with within work, like who, who are some of the couple people that you might have leaned on as just as far as experience goes? And if you had something you were trying to flush out, you would just bounce ideas off of. Yeah, there, when I first started Cat Dog, there, um, there are two or well, three guys actually that were brought in to help me that I didn't really know that I kind of they at least one of them really kind of auditioned for me in terms of what they had done what they were doing this guy Rob Porter who had been uh, a board guy on Hey Arnold and, and also uh, he worked on uh, Rock is Modern Life okay and uh, and he ended up being turning into the creative director after a while but at the beginning he was he was one of the board guys that helped write the pilot and this and Derek Dryman who went on to be the creative director of Spongebob and uh, executive producer of Adventure Time and many other things. He was the other board guy in the show, and they were both amazing. You know, they quickly became good friends of mine. And they were I relied on them tremendously. And then also this, the third guy is who I just was just here moments ago. Uh, Nick Jennings, who's the uh, who's works at Cartoon Network now, but he was he's, he's the art director on Adventure Time, and 
uh, SpongeBob at the beginning and lots of, lots of others. He's a, an amazingly creative guy. He was he was helping me set the style of the show, the visual style of the show. So those are the main the three. Now, when you have when you're flown out there and you guys are working on this pilot, how much of this do you already have flushed out? Obviously, like we said, you had Cat Dog, or you had the theme song, and then you had Cat Dog. Do you have any other characters that you had already had in mind, or was this something once you guys started, you know, sitting around the table and bouncing ideas off of these started to come to light? Yeah, I had. Well, I had you know. With Cat Dog, I had, about, had probably six characters that were kind of drawn and halfway figured out sort of thing. So, so like I said, Winslow, I thought was a different, completely different kind of character, but yeah. he was drawn. Uh, Rancid Rabbit was pretty, it's pretty clear from the very beginning, but he was, he was in the, he was going to be in one of those, uh, those three short films that I was talking about. So he was there in the beginning. And then the Greaser Dogs, they, they kind of all, um, it kind of consolidated into three and there had been four at one point and stuff like that but it's they were all you know they were clearly kind of villains who yeah. were kind of a motorcycle gang type you know they, they were pretty fully formed with the uh, shriek i just like the idea of the smallest the smallest little character a poodle that's just the most vicious of, of them all and that is a girl i really like that there was a girl that was so vicious and uh, so stuff like that those, those were all started before i left chicago that was all from the beginning mm -hmm. but then as you know in any show like this the more stories you do the more fully formed the characters become doesn't yeah. matter how much you put into the bible or how much you think you know as you tell stories you need more and more and you give them more attributes and they become richer and deeper you know? so that's that's part of the process of, of telling stories and when you tell dozens and dozens of stories you get deeper and deeper into these characters about what they're secret fears are what they're what they're worried about what they long for who they love who they hate and all the kind of stuff so um yeah now with with the bible now i've seen a few different ones uh you know i've seen the one for Ed, Ed and eddie i've seen one for samurai jack and there uh, i think david showed me one for cow and chicken mm -hmm. and i've seen like i said i've seen a bunch of them and it's always interesting because depending on who i have on they're either this big or they're two, three, four pages, right? Some of them have been very, very small with maybe one or two lines. How is it for you whenever you're flushing out an entire idea? What was that Bible looking like? Did you even have one? Did you know what a Bible was before you went out? I think I probably didn't. I don't think I'd even heard the term uh, show Bible when I first started Cat Dog. But um, yeah, they run. They do run the gamut in terms of how how thick they are and how how inclusive they are of different things. But I. Um, what I've come, what I've done over the years since Cat Dog is when I pitch shows, I used to try to go in with, with everything, like really show them, you know, show them the fully formed world where they I yeah. asked all the questions in the Bible. And then over time, I've realized, you know, that's it's really you don't really need to, you don't really need to do that. Number one, because it's too, it's too much work to invest on a spec spec project, but also you want you, the more you put into a pitch or into a Bible. Uh, before things are greenlit, the more things they have to say no to. Like it's so much, <laughs> it's better. It's better to make sure the things you have in there are great and and don't get overly complicated with things that with too much information. And yet it's also much better to have have more in your head than you put down on the page. So that once you get into a conversation where they there are questions asked of you, you have answers to questions that they didn't know you had. You know, instead of like instead of like showing your whole hand. It's mm -hmm. like no, you show them. You show them. Uh, you show them a few cards, and then you play more cards as you go. So, idea, so. Got you. Uh, with, I don't know why I haven't asked this of other creators. Uh, it's probably because I just thought about it a, a couple of days ago. Um, but whenever I've seen somebody's original pitch, not so much the pilot, but an original pitch for that original Bible, the art style seems a lot different than what ends up on the finished product. Um, is what you in, uh, originally envisioned, is it almost identical to what finally made it to the screen or how much did it change? It changed a bit. I mean, I think that I was, I'm working on a new project now, you know, I'm in the middle of making a pilot now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this, on this thing and things I've done in between, the, there's much more of an opportunity to, to like really duplicate somebody's quirky style and I've got kind of quirky style onto the screen than there used to be. It used to be a little more difficult. Yeah. With cat with cat dog, I think um, in retrospect, I think some of my style translated really well, and other other parts of it didn't. 
but it was I think it was a it was a pretty close call. It wasn't I didn't I'm not unhappy about it, but I feel like now I think it'd be I'm feeling more confident that I can really pretty much duplicate what I'm having my head on the screen. Yeah. More than anything. It's probably it was probably because of an inexperience at the time, but also it was you know, the technology has just gotten better. It's gotten it's gotten easier to add textures to things and make things feel more like an illustration on the screen and stuff like that. And so that's kind of, I'm kind of working uh, out now how to do this new project and how it's going to look. But I think I feel more confident that I can do it in a way that's going to feel like 100% me. And so, now, uh, are you able to talk about anything about the new project or where? Because we have one question on. Um, like I said, I usually save the fans' questions for last, but uh, you brought it up like twice now. But I'd, I'd figure uh, couldn't hurt to ask. Are you allowed to talk about anything where it might show up or? Yeah, I, I probably shouldn't. I probably shouldn't. But it's it's a it's a it's a comedy. It's a character comedy, and it's um, it's got a lot of music. Man. I'll tell you that. Very cool. We're looking forward to it then, man. As soon as it comes out, I'll make sure that we put up the put up the flare gun so everybody knows where to go. Um, when all of this is going on, do you remember where you started to hit your stride? Because obviously, you said you you were very new to this whole world, right? Yeah. So I got to imagine you go zero to a hundred real quick. Yeah. Right. So at what point in time do you really feel like you hit your stride during cat dog? Uh, I don't know. You know I think probably uh, it started to feel like it was working after, you know, six months or something like that. I think, you know, one of the things about cat dog that was more difficult than some shows is that it was the first time. In fact, it might still be the only time. I'm not sure. But at the time, it was the first time. Uh, that they tried to do a first run script show. So we actually got the very first order was 40 half hours, which was completely unheard of at the time. Like that's just, insane. Yeah. So that's part, part of what happened with Cat Dog was that we had to really hit the ground running. And it was like a, it was a mad dash from the very first moment. To being yeah. like, so that, you know, that's, it was, at the time, it was difficult to find. We were trying to do it as a board-driven show. It was difficult to find enough people to be able to do it. Mm. Um, you know, some of the people that were up, that that started with me, like Derek uh, Dryman and, and Rob Porter, had come up, had worked on Rocco's Modern Life, and they were really wanting to do it uh, as a board-driven show. And I was really open to it because I knew that you know the old time cartoonists had done it that way, and I really liked Ren and Stimpy, and I really liked. Uh, I really liked uh, Rocco, so I was like, "Yeah, let's try to do that." But we had to, we had to have lots. We had to do way more boards, way too fast compared to those shows. Like, you know, they were, you know, those typically the pickles were thirteen or twenty half hours. We had forty, so we had way, lots of board teams, and everybody was trying to learn the show while also, you know, we were writing outlines, and then board guys were writing on the board, and some people were really good at it, and some people weren't so good at it. So we finally it was like, you know what? I think for a little while we're going to write scripts. So that's why we went into scripts. We wrote scripts. And that's why it was just, it was almost impossible to try to do it the other way at the pace that we were going. Um, we ended up having to, like, you know, farm some shows out to the studio in Canada because we couldn't keep up with the crazy pace. So, um, you know, it's like this, you know, thing with a script show where you make a, you make a, we made 20 and then they start airing them. And after four weeks, they've all aired, you know, because they're showing one a day, one a weekday. So it's like, oh my God, <laughs> you feel like you're in the in the cab of a you know a freight train just shoveling coal, coal <laughs> to keep the thing moving. You know? So that was a, that was the thing that was you know a gigantic challenge for, for literally everybody involved, not just the people in the crew, but everybody in, that was working on it in Nickelodeon, just trying to you know they were trying to promote toys and you know everything, books and all this kind of stuff simultaneously. And it was almost like it was in some ways. Uh, it was an experiment. It was a big experiment in terms of like trying to hit, trying to really do everything at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it was the show was popular, but it wasn't you know SpongeBob popular. So it was kind of like you know, in some ways a failed experiment, I believe, in that way because it was like we, there was stuff in the stores. I went. I remember walking into Target and there was a whole section of cat dog stuff, and it had literally just gotten on the air. I mean, there was not there was like the idea that some of the kids are going to go see two episodes and run to the target and want to buy it's just it was like it seemed kind of crazy to me but that's what we that's what was going on so so it was like a gigantic push um where everybody was 
you know, very pushed to the limit. Even though for me, it was a total blast. It was also like madness and the kind of madness of the game. So, yeah. so there's, kind of kind of there's, a, there's a few questions that, that uh, after, after hearing that I, want, I wanted to ask. Uh, the first one, I, or it's not even a question, but it's a statement. I remember when cat dog stuff started hitting the stores. I remember trying to put that into the cart. And my mom was like, absolutely fucking not put that back. That's an abomination, right? Quote, unquote, Peter. Uh, I wish she was here right now. She's at her house. But I would I would say, look, look, Ma, I'm talking to the guy that you said was an abomination. You couldn't let me have this toy. Uh, so I, I tried so hard to buy a toy, but my mom was like, absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, the second thing and the third thing was, uh, do you remember what studio it was in Canada that uh that you farm some stuff out to and do you remember how because you obviously said there was a just a shit ton of people on this project trying to keep up with this pace yeah. now you don't have to talk dollar amount because I, I don't want to get too super personal but do you remember how much each episode cost as far as to produce with that many board artists and that many yeah. writers yeah i'm not really sure i'm not really sure about it. i can't really check with the numbers yeah yeah i don't I don't really remember. I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely knew at some point, but I don't really remember what it cost now. But the, the studio that did some in Canada was Studio B, which is in uh, Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So I went, I went up there a few times. So what was that like going from Chicago to California to, 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 to Canada now? I mean, well, it was, you know, it was, it was I think part, I'm, I'm sure that this happened with other shows too. It's, it's a difficult thing to have so many different people working on the show. In different locations um so it was it wasn't the best you know it was the only solution i think to try to keep up with the pace but it was difficult to, to you know it was kind of difficult to keep up with quality control in terms of the reports that went out even though i think they did a, a reasonable job it was also um and those guys were great and you know, I, I appreciated their work on the show but it was yeah. hard it was hard to, it's, you really need to be you know this is this time of COVID is a challenge and to everybody just because you're not in the room with people enough and it's yeah. actually been working really well considering like you know the show that i've been working on the past three years it's amazing that we didn't skip a beat we just kept going despite the fact that everybody had to go home and it's like fantastic you know that said uh especially when you're first starting up a show it sure would be nice to be in a in a room with some people and have face-to-face uh, -face conversations where you can make eye contact and know when you can start <laughs> talking don't, don't step on other people's lines. We were just talking about the other day about how when you're on when you're on Zoom, you know you never really know when the person's going to stop talk, stop talking. So you're always interrupting, and they're interrupting you, and you know. So anyway, like the it's not as conducive. There's some things that are really actually really great about Zoom, and I actually really appreciate it. I actually kind of like voice directing over Zoom just because, especially with we have we, we had a lot of kid actors in this show we've been working on, and uh, it's actually great because you can you can actually make better eye contact you know on zoom than you can in real life because you're not separated by glass you're like looking right in their face you know so uh, so it's weird there's a weird dichotomy there you know but but mostly I, it would just the idea of trying to you know have people working in korea on the show people working in vancouver on the show people working in burbank on the show you know it's just you know there's a lack of communication sometimes and you've got to you got to go there in person sometimes and you know and the schedules crazy so you just got to do the best you can under the circumstances to keep going so um, make lots of notes and you, know, now, you probably won't remember this because like i said I, I try not to ask these things but what was a normal day during just when everything was hot and heavy with cat dog what would a normal day i mean did you have up at 4 30 in the morning just trying to get as much shit done as possible late nights early mornings do you remember what that was like yeah i mean i tended to work um I would be in the studio pretty normal hours, but I would usually be working at home early in the morning. And this is actually true to this day on everything that I work on work. I get up at five or so and work usually working um, before breakfast and then and then go well now before breakfast and then, you know I have an office outside of the house, but for a while I was in the house for a long time. But it was always kind of like for me, my I don't know why. I think since my kids were born, literally I don't sleep, I've never slept beyond like five or six in the morning for the past in the past 25 years. So uh so in that way it's actually i i don't really mind working a lot but not like this on this show i've been working on recently i was right you know I'm just, it was a story editor plus songwriter plus writer you know i did a lot of stuff mm -hmm. so um 
I just fit, you know, fit it in wherever I could. The thing that's cool about creative work generally is that you're able to work odd hours. So you can take some, you can take some time off in the middle of the afternoon if you have to, but you've been working since five in the morning. So it feels like, you know, feels like you yeah. deserve it. Um, I forget what this question was, but in any case, oh, a typical day, you know, I would, I would usually work um, at home for a while, then go into work. And the thing about animation, and you probably heard this from other creators, but once stuff starts going out to be animated and coming back, uh, and you're working, you're literally working on, you know, 15 shows at the same time in different yeah. levels of development. You know, some 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 things you're writing premises for, some things you're writing outlines for, some you're doing post production on, some you're doing music for. It becomes like a, a madhouse of, you know, uh, of, of this crazy. It's really pretty crazy. It's crazy in a good way. You know, it's like a, it's exciting because you're seeing all these different. But sometimes you really start to forget at what stage any one story is in so you go you start to go we should really do this I mean, we can't do that it's already animated you know what I mean? like we, you know what i mean so i would forget i would literally forget what stage any particular episode was in and then there's just so many people it's true of film directors too you know you hear the, like that 90 percent of their um of their day is just answering questions people yeah. went what color what what color do you want what do you how big this should what's you know what's is this go is this shirt okay you know and that's what it's like. It's like, and you've got have a little stamp of approval, pH, you know, and you go, okay, it's okay, take it. Okay, good, that's good, go, go, go. That's, that's what it's like. And I used to, a long time ago, I worked in, in the newspaper business as an illustrator and design art director and stuff like that, just before. And it's kind of similar. It's like a, trying to get a, a paper, you know, to deadline is a lot like working in animation. So, and some people are cut out for it and other people are kind of, you know, you can see their, their brains, you know, melting because of the pressure. <laughs> And you, you just realize there's some people that just like like this world, and some people don't, you know. So, uh, but it was in a lot of ways it was like the newspaper business in that way. So it felt kind of very comfortable to me this idea of like, oh, we've got to we've got to work on this tonight until it's done because we got to ship it off and we got it's going to be printed and, and in this case animated. So, um, so yeah, it's it's a wild and wooly time. What seems to be because obviously you're an artist, you've written, you do music. I mean, what do you find more gratifying for you? I mean, are you happier at the end of the day for all of those things separately and differently? Or do you have one that you lean towards more? It depends on the day, you know. I actually, what, I, I've, been, what I've been trying to do lately is just, um, I really love doing all those things, you know. So um, sometimes you can't, sometimes you have to really uh, force yourself to focus on one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And that's always been the, that's been more difficult for me than anything in a way. Like I almost think that that's, I have to force myself to like not think about everything simultaneously. So because if you do that, you don't really get a lot done. Um, so that's that's my, has always been my challenge. And mm -hmm. my, even before animation, just like concentrating on one thing at a time and making sure that you're doing it well and then moving on to the next thing. But in terms of like the different disciplines and uh, you know, in the arts, I, I really do love it all. Like I was actually, I just gave a talk for this uh, animation festival in Mexico. And a, part of the message for me is like, if you're an artist, try writing too. If you're, if you're a musician, try drawing. You, know, you should, it's, it, even if you don't do it for a living, doing those other things, exercise a different part of your brain that makes you think in a different way and see things in a different way. I had this guy tell me, this is way before animation, but if this guy told me, a teacher once told me, you know, if you're having trouble writing something, write a poem first and we're like what why would i do that i get last time i wrote a poem it was like in high school it was really bad you know <laughs> but then i it took me years to figure out what he was talking about you know and then i realized yeah it's like if you if you kind of like uh you can't figure out how to write something or draw something or whatever you're trying to do do something else that uses a different kind of brain and makes you think a different way and all of a sudden it looks different to you so and that's the same thing with getting up and you know shooting baskets or uh, going for a walk or riding a bike when you're trying to solve a problem in your head, like a story problem or whatever, it makes you those those moving those muscles really makes your your big muscle in your head work better. So um, <laughs> I'm in favor of that all the time. Yeah. Guess the old brain meets moving. Uh, you just said you know shooting hoops, man. Are you a basketball fan? No, not really. Not really. Oh man, I thought we were going to be best friends. Oh, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, no, I'm not really. No, it's really weird. I don't know what's wrong with me, but. Um, cause when I was in, when I was a kid, I was really into sports, uh, somewhat playing, but also just watching. And then at a certain point, I just 
I I still would I still enjoy watching sports when I ever do if I just don't I really yeah. really do. I th I find myself in this situation now and it's it's I I whenever I'm doing something like watching sports or doing some I feel like oh, there's something else I should be doing. Yes. Yes. And I don't and I it's it's not really a good I'm not proud of it. I mean I actually I feel like somebody was talking about how they love putting together jigsaw puzzles and whenever I think about doing a jigsaw puzzle I think of it, I don't know if you know watch Citizen Kane but there's that thing with his wife his wife in front of the fireplace working on the puzzles and I always think of that I think like oh my god please don't make me do a jigsaw puzzle <laughs> every piece that I every piece I try to fit in there I'm going to think about everything else I should be doing in my life so it, it's um, funny to bring up jigsaws because uh, I'm a huge I'm a huge Peanuts fan and my wife got this for me uh, for Christmas a couple years ago yeah. and every time she comes into the office she's like you gonna put that together and I'm like yeah eventually and the same i actually have a, good, a lot of good friends I, I even have friends who are really great artists who love doing jigsaw puzzles so it's not i'm i'm not it's no judgment on my part it's more it's more me you know but um and i actually have a couple of friends who are artists who are, are making some money by making jigsaw puzzles, like actually yeah. getting the printed on jigsaw puzzles because jigsaw puzzles have gone through the roof during covid i'm oh, not sure you get that it's like, <laughs> it's a huge deal. Yeah, yeah so anyway it's funny <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I I can't. I was hoping that I was going to learn that maybe when I got a little bit older, because I'm 32, maybe when I got a little bit older, that time would really start to slow down for me, and I'd be able to fit a lot more than I can actually fit into my schedule than yeah. I can, and, which I can't because you know we just had our second kid in July, mm -hmm. so I have a two month old, then I have an 11 and a half year old, um, yeah. you know, married, and then I have to work, so I have to you know I have to drive to the restaurant. Um, those are, you know, depending on the day, those could be long days. We're getting ready to hit our busy season. And then I come home and I got four dogs and a cat, you know, so I got to play with them. I got to play with the baby. I got to play with the oldest one. I got to play with the wife. It's just like, fuck dude. And then I want to do this podcast thing. I'm like, yeah. God damn, I, I, I need more hours in the day. Yeah. Pete. Pretty sure you can say the same thing. <laughs> you know, one thing that, one thing I did, and this is that, you know, it really helped me, but, um, I'm not sure if it's for everybody, but I, I decided maybe it was like a year and a half ago that I wanted to write a musical. Mm -hmm. And I actually not, I don't really like, I like, there's like only a few musicals I really like. I'm not really a huge musical fan, even though I appreciate the, pe the people that do them and stuff like that. But, you know, there's only, there's like Singing in the Rain. There's a few different musicals I love and then everything else I, I really don't like that much. But um, I kind of decided to do that. I haven't really done it yet. But one thing that I did when I decided to do that was I, I said, I'm going to, every single morning, I don't care what I'm doing that day, I'm going to spend 10 minutes working on this. Yeah. So, and, and then that, what happens is, and if you make that commitment to yourself, and I'm not saying this is for you, I'm just saying like, this is the thing that worked for me. It's kind of, it's kind of like those morning pages in writing. That people Write talk. it down. You know, I, I really, what you realize is that if you commit to 10 minutes, then most likely you'll work long. Like once you actually start, chances are you work for half an hour. Almost, yeah. almost it's very unlikely you're only work for 10 minutes on a song. And I started writing a song every morning for like months. I mean, I wrote a shit ton of songs because I made that commitment to myself. Yeah. Like I, I the thing I think of, I, what I realized was kind of like, if you, if you, uh, if you commit to yourself that you're going to go down into your car and start the car in the morning, chances are you're going to drive it for a little while. <laughs> you're yeah. going to just sit there in an idling car, but it really worked. I mean, it actually, it actually got me to, and it, it's also similar to, um, working as an illustrator for newspapers and stuff like that, where you have these deadlines where you have to, you have to have this thing done by three o'clock in the afternoon. In this case, it's like, if you have this kind of like, uh, you, you created this kind of false deadline for yourself where you're gonna do this thing every day, suddenly you start piling up hours mm -hmm. of working on this thing that you, before you thought you had no time for. Like it literally, I was like, what? How could that have happened? I had no time, you know? So yeah. it's cool, it's cool. Then. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to try that because there's it, it's funny you say you know if, if you're a creative person try doing other things. I just got into writing, and I don't want to. It always sounds pretentious when I say that because I barely passed high school. I've got a college degree for the culinary arts, right? So I mean, it's that's a creative endeavor. I love that. I used to draw back in the day. And then it wasn't until, uh, like I said, I, I live in Orlando and we went to Universal Studios when Nickelodeon Studios was still there. And my first love uh, for anything, what I thought I was going to do for the rest of my life, I wanted to be an animator. 
Right? I yeah. wanted to draw. I love drawing. I could always, <clears throat> I could always see somebody's stuff and put it to paper. No problem. Yeah. Um, there was a couple of things like fingers and hands and stuff yeah. like I always had issues with when I was younger. Uh, but I just didn't draw those. I would just draw, you know, from yeah. chest up, that type of yeah. stuff. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you learn, you learn that you whatever whatever it is that's uh, plaguing you, you learn how to get around it, right? So. I just absolutely loved it. I remember we, we went to Universal Studios. One of the uh, only good memories I ever had of uh, my father took me and my younger brother to Universal Studios when we were younger. And man, I was probably five, six years old, somewhere around there. So this is 94, 95, 96 era, somewhere in there. I know that for a fact, before we went to prison. And uh, we go there and as we're going through the through the, the turnstiles, the him is a ticket. They say, hey, we're doing a demonstration for a cartoon. We're getting ready to roll out here in just a little while. We'd love for you guys to come up and tour. And we you go up the stairs and then you'd look down and it was the boardroom, essentially. It was the art room where all the, the board artists were there. And I think they were still trying to transition everything over to Los Angeles and the Burbank area for Nickelodeon mm -hmm. Studios. So there was a very, it was a small skeleton crew, essentially. Right, right. And what they were doing is they were just trying to get people hyped up for this event. Right. and there was a guy down there and it was spongebob squarepants was the show that they were working on right so there's a guy <clears throat> this guy down there and he's drawn and then he keeps ripping shit down balling it up and throwing it over his shoulder and i was like what the heck? what's going on why is he throwing this away and then the lady that was giving us the tour is like <clears throat> if it's not good enough or if it's not what he's looking for he has to start over because they have a certain thing that they have to do they have to meet guidelines and all this other stuff and, you know, like I said, five, six, seven years old, however old I was, my brain could not take that. And I was like, well, my mom would have loved that picture I just drew her. So I would have kept yeah. that one. And then she's like, well, that doesn't yeah. work like that with the animators. It's like, well, I don't think I'm going to be an animator because I think everything <laughs> I do is fantastic. Right. So yeah. needless to say, that's why I cook for a living. But nonetheless, man. Uh, so hot and cat and dog, we're going hot and heavy. Uh, when everything starts to like fall into place. Does it, does the, the schedule, is it consistently just balls to the wall the entire show or did it start to like taper back once you guys started to hit a stride? Yeah. Well, you know, the thing that, that every show, unless, you, unless you continue to run, uh, you know, it's not like SpongeBob has been going for so long now that they, they literally never, uh, they've had some hiatuses here and there, but they don't, they don't ever taper off. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure about this, but generally speaking, if you're going to keep going, 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 you never have that period where you're chafing enough to just finishing yeah. up shows where there's not much work to do. Mm -hmm. But in, for most shows, you know, that only run for you know a few years, it, it starts out, it starts out fast, but it doesn't start out insane because you're not doing everything at the same time. Like you yeah. get to the middle of the show, like I was talking about before, where you're getting, you're doing everything, to, you're doing different stages of work on every, all kinds of different episodes. Then it's just completely falls to the wall in a way that. You can never if you've never worked in it before you can't believe how crazy it is you know yeah. but then once once you start you get over that hump and you're into the uh everything has really been boarded and now you're now you're kind of just getting stuff back and you're working it on it as comes like then it seems like more reasonable you can get you can wrap your mind on it it seems more finite like the first time i ever saw an actual animation schedule because when you know, cat dog was picked up for 40 episodes we were at this bar and they just opened up, they unrolled this piece of paper that was the entire length of the bar. It was like, just like, and it was just, you know, these, I don't know if you've ever seen these schedules, but it's like different colors for different yeah. you know, paint, you know, character, whatever. And you, I looked at the thing, I had no idea what the hell, you know, like, what is, what is this, you know? Cause you can, you can kind of see it at the timeline, but you don't even, you can't even, it's, it's, first of all, it's really small and it's like different colors. You're looking like, what am I looking at? I'm like, oh. That's, and then, and then at a certain point you're thinking like, it feels like you'll never get over this mountain. It feels like, you know, this will never, you know, it feels kind of endless in a weird way. Yeah. It's so into it, you don't even have time to back up about it and put it in perspective. Like I realize now that we will really be done with this in three years, but to me, it looks like this might be my life for the rest of my life. So, <laughs> yeah. But it's great, you know, it's, it's just crazy, especially if you've never seen it before. And they're like, you know, there's some people that are really experienced to them. It just looks like a schedule to them. They don't, it doesn't make their, you know, eyes roll back in their heads, but then if you've never seen it before, you just like, looking at it like i can't even you know i can't use a regular calendar so using you know look, looking at this thing is just mind-blowing so yeah so that's the way but in other words it gets it gets the craziest in, the, in that in that mountain it's, it's kind of like climbing the mountain and it's like at the top of the mountain is just insane you know yeah. and then it, but in this case because we started out with so many episodes it started more crazy than it would have been in a normal show it's because the schedule was start you know fast from the very beginning so um, anyway, 
it's, yeah it's just wild they just sit there and they roll it's like kicking the red carpet they just watch it go um, yeah. I, mean, I got to imagine how like you just, holy shit this is still still rolling there um as we start to you know get towards the middle and the end of cat dog i mean you said it, the the toys had came out almost instantly so simultaneously with the sh with the show opening correct it, it was pretty pretty it felt close. like it, it felt yeah. i mean it, it felt like i'm not really sure in deck timing but it definitely seems seemed too soon to me and i was not connected <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like something I wouldn't have done, but then your hands like I was on, you know, the thing about all this stuff is that it's such a it's such a rush to see this stuff that it's not like you're gonna you're gonna complain about it. It's more like, oh my God, look at this. There's a whole department in, in Target. That's fantastic. And then it's like, I mean, I've done in different parts of my career, I've had things happen where like it feels like, oh my God, this is so fantastic. And then you realize, oh well. Yeah, but we've got to sell this stuff, you know. <laughs> it's not just because they made it; you got to sell it too. So I had that same situation I've with books I've done, where you go like, "Well, this is fantastic. This is really great." And then, you know, you realize that with with anything that you're selling, whether it's in movies or TV or or books, um, there's it's a sales job from the beginning end. You've got like, you know, you got to sell the book, and then you got to sell, you got to uh, get it, you got to get you got an agent, and the agent's got to sell it to the publisher, you know, the editor, and the editor's got to sell it to the publisher then the publisher's got to sell it to the salesman who sells yeah. stuff from the publisher then the salesman has to sell it to the stores and the people in the stores have to put it on the shelf where you want it to be you know so it's just like every step along the way there's something that can go wrong you know so it's just like this whole uh it's a sales job up day and night from everyone when all of those products are rolling out and you're walking into the stores first off do they send you whenever the products or whenever toys get made I know some people have written it in. I mean, Mark Hamill's famously known for back in his Star Wars contract that he wanted, like, I think two of everything that they ever made. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, he could sell his entire collection and make more money on that than he could with the film contract he had, which is insane when you think about it. Yeah. I mean, but as a showrunner or creator, do they typically send you whenever you guys license stuff? Do they send you like one of something or do you have to ask for that type of shit? I have to ask for it. I'm, and I'm sure different people have different contracts, but I think that I, you know, there was stuff at the beginning it was more like at the beginning they sent they would send stuff that i think that all these things are like you know when when you're the center of attention and they they want to make you happy they they do lots of things for they, they stop doing later <laughs> they stop doing later so there have been tons of products i've never i like in fact there's you know a recent thing that came out this uh, new fighting game that yeah that dog's in i had no idea that was coming out until somebody sent it to me and so and i was, it was you know delightful to see that it came out but i had no idea that was coming out so um and it's just kind of funny, but it's great. You know, it's so awesome that, you know, 20, whatever years later, uh, you know, this new game comes out and, and Catholic's in it. So it's great. Love it. it. It's wild. Like when I saw that, I was like, man, this is, I didn't, I didn't think it was real when I saw the trailer. Cause I'm like, there's, there's no way Nickelodeon is going to try to do this because I don't know if you're big in the games or not. I, I don't have time to play them, but whenever the oldest wants to play them, I have no problem just whooping his ass in Smash Brothers and Mario Kart. Those are the two one. Like he he always asks, he's like, when do I get to win? I'm like, when you get better, because I'm not going to let you win. This, this does not work like that. You it, you know, when you beat me, it's time to take that out to the pasture and put him <laughs> down out back. You're not going to beat me anytime soon. But when I saw this, we had my, my son had showed me, he's like, hey, do you see this? And I was like, that's ah, not real. He's like, I I'm pretty sure it's real because Nickelodeon is the one that's on their YouTube channel. I'm like, Nickelodeon got hacked because they're not making this shit. They're not going to try to compete. And then I watched it and I started seeing it just blow up. It went, it, it was trending for quite some time. And I'm like, holy shit, I think Nickelodeon's doing this. Um, but getting to, to some of the products and stuff, do you remember the weirdest one that you saw? Or is there one that you stuck, that stuck, sticks out to you the most? That you're like, man, I really liked having this. Oh, I don't know. You know, there's, um, it's a weird thing because, you know, I think this is probably true of most creators. You have, you have, you don't really have final say, you have advisory capacity and you get to, you get to give notes, you know, yeah. you give notes along with everything else. So I would find a bunch of stuff on my desk that I had to give notes on and like draw on or like say, this doesn't look right. And then you just kind of like hope for the best, you know, and like sometimes something there's some manufacturers that would do a really good job and be on model on model and other things were just like what the how do we possibly make something this ugly, you know. I remember getting a conversation with one of the consumer products person like do they are they trying to make this look, look awful or is, it, is that what their goal is, you know, so. But then some of stuff was beautiful there's some certain things that came out. Um, you know certain 
certain apparel stuff was cool. Some of the some of the plush toys were really pretty great. And the, there's one, <laughs> I have a bunch of the stuff in storage, but there was one uh, talking cat dog, this big plush talking cat dog that we had in a, we were getting all this stuff and we put it under a box in her, her bed and in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, Tom Kenny started talking to me like, that was fun, that was fun. <laughs> This is really funny. So Take your pants, because I would have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there's, a, you know, there's a, so there's some, you know, there's some stuff that was really, there's some video games they did were pretty nice, and there's some some apparel that was nice, and there's some apparel that was just awful, and some some little toys that were great. There's sort of the Burger King did some really pretty nice toys, I thought. And, yeah. You know, so there, you know, it kind of it runs a gamut in terms of quality, and I think it's probably true of, um, of most shows. I think you know, um, I'm sure there's stuff that. Steve Hillenberg hated that came out and uh, and but there's so much SpongeBob stuff that you know yeah. there's a lot of really good stuff that enough good stuff that you can avoid maybe avoid the stuff that's not so great. So I'm, I'm at this point I'm wide open to any, pretty much anything they want to do. I would rather be a part of it and not just have it happen, you know, uh, independent of me. But I um, there was certainly a point at the beginning where I would never have thought I would want to do Baby Cat Dog. I don't really think there's much chance that anybody wants to do Baby Cat Dog, but I did get, you know, I have gotten some consumer products recently sent to me that are, they're pretty much like Baby Cat Dog. Like they've been, they've been yeah. like, like, and they're, it's kind of just funny to me. Like it doesn't make me mad at all. It makes me, it makes me laugh because it's just so weird. Are they in diapers or no? Well, no, just like there's a, I've seen some, some Christmas ornaments that are clearly, because we actually did versions of Cat Dog on the show, like flashbacks when they're, when they're really, really young. Mm -hmm. So they look pretty much like what we did on the show. So it doesn't bother, you know, it doesn't bother me at all. Like, yeah. it's kind of weird, so so <clears throat> with that question specifically that I asked you that you get asked most, how often do you think you get asked that question? Uh, all, the, all the time. I mean, I I've actually, from, up. Day, from really day, from day one, it's never, ever, ever really? stopped. Yeah. I mean, I remember, uh, from, from the very beginning it's the most it's the most obvious question to ask which actually really cracked me up when because i guess you know i never really saw it but i've seen the stills from this family guy did a thing on it where they asked the question about it. it's just really funny because it just cracked me up like that somehow it took these 20 you know ivy league uh, educated writers to come up with this question that every kid asks after after five minutes of watching the show so i just i just thought it was funny even though you know more power to him, but I just thought it was kind of funny that like, because it was probably like, you know, 15 years after the show had stopped production. And then there's an episode about how, isn't this, like, how does Cat Dog go to the back? <laughs> just kind of correct me. But, um, but no, I mean, I, you know, at the beginning, what happened was that kids would ask me and I would, I kind of attacked it like this, that like, you know, well, you know, I've never, I've never seen them go to the bathroom. I don't know how, I actually do know how they go to the bathroom, but I have, I've told them that I, that I will never divulge that information, number yeah. one. But also, also like um, I want to make sure that the littlest kids know they're not going to explode. They they do go to the bathroom. <laughs> they, it's not going to be detrimental to their health not to go to the bathroom. And uh, and so we're everything's cool, you know. So that's kind of the idea. And I and I also like ask them like you you don't really really know how Mickey Mouse goes to the bathroom either. So I know that you think you know you understand his physiology, but we don't really know kind of what he looks like with his clothes off. So anyway. it, it's funny because those those two questions I posed you, how does cat dog go to the bathroom? And then what's under double D's hat? Until I started this podcast, never once did I ever think, how does this conjoined dog and cat take a shit? How? Why? No, I'm sitting here laughing at what what's going on on the screen. I don't give a shit what they do or what they have to do or what they need to do. Like, so when I posted so I posted uh, this this uh, interview twice, um, one saying, hey, get your questions in, and one saying, hey, last call for questions. And I shit you not, no pun intended, um, mm -hmm. at least seven of the first questions, whether it was Twitter, yeah. Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, yeah. what have you. Yeah, absolutely. It was it's all really funny. When I, meet, when I meet people, it's really funny because they will approach me with that question thinking, Oh, I bet you've never heard this question before. It's really funny. You'd be like, you'd be like I, do have, I, do have, I do have one question. Like, <laughs> and before they even can get it out, I go like, right. let me guess. Let me guess. Just give it a wild guess what your question's going to be. 
That's really funny. Is, uh, is but, it more men or women that ask that question? I think more men. Yeah, I got to imagine that just men are filthy animals. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well, you know, the other thing is that, you know, we, I, um, on cat dog, on cat dog, the, you know, board artists and character designers and stuff like that, there are tons of really wild, uh, you know, drawings on post it notes that floated around during cat dog. Uh, <laughs> You know, posing lots of solutions to all kinds of questions like that. So, um, and I was, you know, I was much more amused by that than horrified by it. It was really amazing. What was cool. your favorite post-it note? Well, just all kinds of, you know, weird sexual positions, <laughs> everything. You know, just everything. You know, uh, there's a whole. There's actually a um, somebody from he, who's actually on Hey Arnold at the time. He had he had, collect, he had taken pictures of all. Of all they weren't weren't pornographic ones, but just yeah. different takes of cat dog, like that everybody had drawn during the production of cat dog that are just so, I just posted them on Facebook a couple months ago because they were so great. Like tons of these post-its of different, like things like uh, different variations on cat dog, like one was gnat hog and stuff like that. So it was a little tiny gnat connected to a hog, stuff like that. It's really great. And it was really, really funny and they're really, it was really funny to see. I felt like I take it as a tribute more than anything. It's kind of, it's just a cool riff on, you know, the idea of two conjoined characters. So it's fun. Yeah, we, we actually have a question about uh, different characters. Um, and as we start to transition into the fans' questions, is you know, I want to keep you too much longer, man, because it's Friday. I'm pretty sure you got some shit to do. You don't want to look at my yeah. face all day. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything uh, that you are working on that you're allowed to talk about that we can push the fans towards now? Obviously, we can't talk about the project we you know you alluded to just a little bit ago because you can't say anything yet. Mm -hmm. But anything that's out there now that you want people to go yeah. see, whether it's music, yeah, TV, so you know. Yeah, so you know the um, the show that I was working on for the past, it's actually more than three years, I guess three and a half years, um, is this show called Let's Go Luna. That's a Joe Murray show, mm -hmm. created by Joe Murray for PBS, and it's a, it's a preschool show, but it's really it's great. It's actually really great. Um, so if, for people that have kids who are little, it's a PBS show. It's animated. It's starring uh, Judy Greer, who's a really great actress, and she's the she plays the moon, and the moon comes down from the sky and hangs out with these kids. Mm -hmm. So I, I was a story editor on the show and wrote tons of songs for it. And uh, I also did all these animated interstitials that are like uh, almost like independent animated films that are instead of commercials, because they don't have any commercials on PBS, so you have to have interstitials. And instead of just doing most most animated shows on PBS do uh, live action interstitials that are usually kind of educational and stuff like that, we decided to do folk tales and fairy tales and songs and stuff like that um, in different animated styles. So they're like in the middle of the show that has its own style, we have these animated interstitials that are all, you know, stop motion, paper cut, every every kind of animation. So I was in charge of those and wrote all those and wrote songs from stuff like that. So it was really, it was super fun. It was a really fun, fun show to work on. Sure. And like I said, you know, I became, I, you know, I've known Joe Murray since way back in Nickelodeon days, but um, we became really close friends working on the show and it was, it was really great. So, yeah. That's cool. Uh, so that's out. That's out. That's been on the air for a couple of years, and still, we're still, we're just finishing up the last. We've done like sixty-five half hours or something like that, and uh, we're just finishing up the last one now. So it's it's on the air. Beautiful. Well, I'm pretty sure I'll be watching it very soon once the uh, youngest one gets to that watching stage. You know, yeah. I'm pretty sure I'll be yeah. watching yeah. that because I watched a lot of Dinosaur Train with my oldest son when he was coming yeah. up on the PBS show. Right. Speaking of talking toys, you said Tom Kenny was under your bed, not the not the yeah. actor, but the you know the animatronic. Yeah. I don't want people to think that Tom Kenny's a creeper. Yeah, it was a toy. Uh, so, but uh, we had bought these and I just talked about, I can't remember who I talked to. Oh, it was Randy Myers. I had him on on Wednesday. We were talking about it. <clears throat> but uh, Dinosaur Train had um, the little toys that you could stick the batteries in and they talked to each other, right? So you had the, the uh, T-Rex, the other one, yeah. and I think the other one was a pter pterodactyl or some shit like that. It was crazy. And we're at... We're, we're at the table eating dinner and then he had had the things plugged in and turned on and they were standing right next to each other and then we're just eating talking about our day and over on the side you hear these people or these little things start laughing you're like holy shit this place is haunted right so i i, I meant to bring that up when you're talking about tom kenny under your bed the tom <laughs> kenny toy not tom kenny but not tom kenny um but <laughs> nonetheless man 
as we transition into uh, into the fans' questions, before we get to that, just one one quick moment, uh, one quick second, excuse me. Uh, Joe Murray was the first cartoon with Rocco's Modern Life that I was not allowed to watch. Not only was I not allowed to have a cat dog toy, I was not allowed to watch Joe Murray because my oldest yeah. sister, or my my only older sister, uh, Shelly, uh, was watching Rocco's Modern Life when I was very young. Probably too young to watch that, especially going back now and listening to it. But even at fucking five, six years old, there's no way in hell I could have caught anything that that right. show was going on. Yeah. But uh, there was a scene in there, and I can't remember their names, but I remember uh, everybody was at the mall, and then they were the the two little dinosaur looking guys were digging in their nose and then flicking boogers and stuff, right? And then my my sister went and told on me. She ratted on me, right? She's like, hey, mom, look at what Julian's watching. And then she comes and turn this fucking shit off. So not only was I not, like I said, not allowed to have a cat dog toy. I was not allowed to watch Rocco, but I didn't listen to my mom. I went, I waited until she was away. Whenever, whenever it was on, I was watching it. That one and in living color were two shows I was not allowed to watch for obvious reasons, of course, you know. Um, but uh, I would sneak away so I could watch those two shows specifically. Um, yeah. as as we get into badge of, the badge of honor for me <laughs> well i'm glad man we need to get a we need to get a t-shirt made badge of honor I apparently, I apparently got this is before that but one a book that I, one of the book early books i did for kids um supposedly according to the person this happened to got got a librarian fired at a school for for having it on the shelf so so but there's a, it's like another thing i'm i feel bad i felt bad for her but i also felt like well that's another that's another <laughs> oh man you should for sure try to find that story on the internets and then uh, put it up on your refrigerator uh -huh. i'd have that shit laminated i know so um we got some fans questions here uh chase wants to know is there any chance on a reboot i don't know i mean i it's completely up to nickelodeon now i um, haven't They've, they've hinted at it a couple of times or people not really in an official way, but I've heard rumblings a little bit, but I kind of doubt it. Like, I actually don't think that, uh, I don't think that the reboots that they've done other than possibly Rugrats now were really through the roof in terms of success. So I was kind of thinking, you know, once uh, Rocco did one and Invader Zim and Arnold that maybe they were going to go down the list, but I think, I don't, I'm not really sure about this. I shouldn't talk about anybody else's projects, but I didn't get the impression that they were wildly successful at reboots. I think that the Hair Arnold one, I, they played on Nickelodeon. I think it was kind of maybe the false assumption that um, kids now would have some connection to Arnold that they didn't. And then the other ones they released on Netflix, and I'm not I don't, I'm not sure I shouldn't talk about the yeah. ratings. I don't know what the ratings were, but any, in any case, I kind of felt like after those happened that the, the, the prospects got a little dimmer for Catholic, but I don't know. I don't really, I know that there are people, there are people at Nickelodeon who have talked about it and would like to do it, but I don't know that, you know, there's any, any movement on that. So. Well, I mean, I would love to see it. And <clears throat> it's something about those three shows specific. So I absolutely loved all three of them. I, yeah. especially and there's not a slight against any of the other two shows, but the Jungle movie specifically, it hit me so hard in the field. Like I was a grown ass man in 2017 crying at this movie. I don't know if you saw it, but the Jungle movie, when he sees his parents and then his parents drop him off to his, his first day of school, even though he's been going to school for five or six years, however long it's been since, you know, his parents have been gone. Like you, especially as a parent and on, on your kid's first, yeah. first day of school, you feel that. Like my wife broke down right there. I could not break down because I was still in uniform and I don't want anybody. It, it's I've brought it up a couple of different times on podcasts, but mental health, there is a really bad stigma and there still is a really bad stigma about PTSD and mental health, especially with veterans and everything like that. It's not only now just starting to come to light where it's, I guess it's okay or more acceptable to talk about it. Um, but back then there was a, I don't know if there was a shooting or something had happened overseas where a uh, veteran had went just berserker and just killed a whole bunch of people. So, you know, whenever something like that happens, they really just tighten the constraints on us. And you, you, you don't, what I'm getting at is you just didn't want to say, and it's not a macho thing. It's not anything like that. You just didn't want to be seen, you know, being emotional shit like that. So I, I had to wait till I got back in my car to cry when I dropped off my, my, my oldest son. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bradley wants to know who are cat dogs, real parents. 
<laughs> I think we we'll have to do a reboot to get, answer that question. <laughs> I don't, all right. Yeah. So I, you know, yeah, we, it was a little bit of a misdirect. We had we, they, after that long search, they found their adoptive parents instead of their real parents. So um, there are still, you know, I I do think that it's a possibility that if we ever did something, we would get into that. But um, yeah, right now it's not an answerable question. Well, Antonio, it looks like you're going to have to tweet at Nick until they answer your prayers, man. Uh, tell them we want a reboot. That's right. Uh, Antonio wants to know, <clears throat> and this is what we were talking about, where they were taking different animals and putting them together. If Nick, yeah. Nick didn't approve a dog and cat fuse together, which animals would you fuse together? Rat dog, <laughs> rat frog, or rat frog? Is there, <laughs> there anything else that you wouldn't mind fusing together there, uh, Professor Frankenstein? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, this is not really an answer to that question, but there was a, do you know the newspaper Weekly World News? Mm -hmm. Remember that? Actually, made, produced in California, I mean, uh, Florida, I believe. Yeah. I think, in, yeah, the, I think all those uh, tabloid, a bunch of those tabloid newspapers were from Florida. It wouldn't surprise me one single no. bit. <laughs> there was actually an article, there was an article that came out long after Cat Dog was out of production that was this whole story about how um, this mad scientist had created an actual cat dog. And there was, a, it's like, just like the Nickelodeon cartoon and had, had this really bad, super bad Photoshop version of a real, a real cat and a real dog stuck together. It was really funny. And then I, I actually called the guy who was the editor of it. It's out, I think it went, it's out of business now, which we were on this, but I called him and said, Wonder why. Yeah, <laughs> telling him how, how honored I was to be included in their, in their, in their paper. So, but no, I mean, I think it's, there's been, you know, like I said, there's, a, I can, in fact, if you, if you want, I can send you those drawings because they're really funny. They have like, it runs the gamut in terms of like what other characters could be connected to each other. Um, there's one that's just called like dog dog. That's like two headed, you know, <laughs> other, it's just every, everything you can think of, you know? Um, but no, I mean, I, you know, we, we uh, there's many possibilities that could be funny. So I can't, I can't really choose one. That's the perfect answer to that question. Got you. Like I said, I, I love this part of the, uh, the interview because <clears throat> some of these things I'd never even thought of. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, to answer your question on the art. Yeah. If you got any, any of the art that you can email over, I'd love to do it. Cause like I said, whenever I have people on, I write articles about them after that. And then if people mm -hmm. want to read, cause I'm just trying to stretch a different muscle, like you were talking about earlier, I've only done one so far. I'm working on another two now. Um, but Ricardo wants to know, and we talked rancid rabbit earlier. How does rancid rabbit manage all of these jobs without <laughs> sleep? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I mean, he's meant to be like, you know, there's, it's kind of a typical thing, and especially in silent films and the Three Stooges and stuff like that, they would have one, they would have one uh, main character actor playing a villain who would show up in all different kinds of places, you know, he'd have different jobs, he'd be the, he'd be the mayor, he'd be the, you know, the dog catcher, he'd be the teacher, like, and that's kind of the idea, it's like a, the idea of keeping, keeping the roles that you want to use within the repertory group that you've got. Because you have a really clear character like Rancid Rabbit, why have another character that's similar to him in another role? So yeah. that's the idea, really, is to have have him have all these different jobs. And it's a fun. I like the. It's just a funny idea because you can you can play with that. Like, how does he? How does he from from you know in, within one episode have two different jobs? How does he? How does he hold these jobs down? And uh, it's just a, a, a running gag that I really like. And I you know it also gives a it gives a face. To you know, authority that uh, one can rebel against in any any given situation. So it's just kind of a cool device. You got to fight know. the man. Uh, yeah. Sean wants to know: um, Was there any was there any plans or concepts for a feature based around the characters or a crossover film with other Nicktoons? I'm assuming it means back in the day. Was there anything? I remember hearing. You know, I think only in I think only in video games. I don't know that. Uh, I know that they did that later with other characters. Um, I remember hearing about that. No, I, there was never any. I think you know, one, there are kind of conversations about everything you can think of at different times. Yeah. So that stuff sounds. You know, at one point we we're going to do. They wanted to do an IMAX version of a cat dog short, stuff like that, and which didn't happen. But there's. A, it's just like in the same way that any anybody, you and I would brainstorm about. You know fantasize about different things that you can yeah. do in your life it's like that's what that's what networks do like what if we did this what if we did this what if we did this and 
and some of those things get done and some don't. So, but I'm sure, so at some point, I'm sure somebody talked about that, but no, that did not happen as far as I know. Yeah, just throwing, it, throwing everything against the wall to see what sticks. Yep. Uh, Jacob, longtime fan of the show, he wants to know. Thanks for writing in, Jacob. Who's your favorite, cat or dog? Yeah. We got to put you on the spot here, man. Pick your favorite yeah. kid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm much more like, much more of a dog than a cat. Personally, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm much more uh, outwardly loving and Happy. optimistic. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm happier. I mean, I it, it, I think in a weird way, I'm I'm a combination. Like I have a, I really love dark humor. So I'm yeah. I have a, I have a dark streak in me. But then ultimately, I'm like a, a dark optimist. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, <laughs> kind of, I'm kind of, optimist. Kind of, yeah, I'm kind of a I'm kind of a combination of both. I'm definitely much. I mean, I think it's for me, it's hard not to love dog more. Mm -hmm. um and that's i'm I actually love dogs more than i love cats also but yeah. even though i've had many many cats and i i like cats but i don't think I, i've ever really loved cats i just kind of like like them up with them yeah they're right. like they're like yeah. that they're, they're like that uh that roommate that doesn't pay shit and then you have to pick up after him yeah I, like i said i've got four dogs and i absolutely i love the cat because i she's it's funny because it's my son's cat he wanted her and so you know he takes care of it and everything like that but she is tied to my hip yeah. right all i have to do is look at it go pss, pss, and i go like this and she can be on his lap and she jumps off of him and runs over i was like what does it feel like to know that your dad's cat or your cat loves your dad more than you yeah. like i said you know i there's there's tons of people that love cats more than dogs but and i think but i think i'm not sure about this but i kind of look at it like this like the people that really like cats more than like they like dogs like that they're not lovable they yeah. like they like they like, like the taste. Same. <laughs> right. so, it's, but that's just the it's just the my personal taste, you know. I, you know, so and I do I actually do like that about cats too. But it's not I don't I can't. It's hard to love them back. It's more kind of like you know I, I love the fact that you're such a pain in the ass. It's kind of cool. They, they tolerate you. They don't they don't give a shit if you're there. I mean, a dog will probably eat you if you die and they're starving. But a cat's yeah. for sure gonna eat you if you die and they're starving. Yeah. Um, Tobias. I mean, we've already asked that question, but I just want to know, Tobias, I'm pretty sure he answered your question. It was about the series you're working on and we could talk about this yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sparkster wants to know, nope, you already answered that one. Uh, Agent 00 Sonic wants to know, uh, do you remember any uh, scenes that you had to create that might've been intense? I don't know really what, what, he's, what he or she, I, I apologize. Uh, I don't know what he or she is really alluding to. Was there anything that when you were animating that was just, really intense maybe a shit ton of pressure or you know you guys were under the fire to get it done one stick not, out to you not really i mean i think that there are things that uh this doesn't really answer the question but it's reminding me of this that there are things that um you don't ahead of time you don't really know that it's going to be difficult to do until you get into it, you know and that becomes yeah. more difficult than you think it's going to be so and then other times it's the opposite but you can definitely get into a situation where you think that you're telling a simple story and then in the middle of it, you realize that this isn't working. You know? Yeah. And you have to reboot and stuff like that. But um, it's all, you know, the more you work in any field, the more you are comfortable with the idea of everything needs work, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, there are certain people that go like, you know, I did this thing and they want all these notes or they tell me all these things are wrong. It's like, well, you know, you don't have to do all the notes, but number one, but number two, everything you make, there's going to be problems, you know, yeah. and, you, and that's, if you, don't if you don't like the idea of problem solving, this isn't for you, because that's what, <laughs> this is about problem solving, you know, so, um, yeah. We got to, we got to just a couple more here. Casimir wants to know, <clears throat> and we talked about your, your role in music uh, a little bit earlier in the episode, but he wants to know, uh, how big of a role does music play into your art process? And did you always want Cat Dog to have a blues sound to it? Yeah, it's kind of blues, country. It's got you know, a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, in fact, you know, when I, this is really funny. I never, I'm not sure if I've ever told anybody this, but in the early versions that I was, when I was working on those three short films, for a little while, I was thinking about calling them, <laughs> um, what was it, uh, like Jim Bob Dog and Jim Bob Cat. I thought it was kind of funny that we could could really be almost a little bit a little bit southern, a little bit hillbilly. Yeah, I was, you know, I've always been a country music fan, blues fan, and stuff like that. So um, somehow I thought it'd be kind of funny if maybe one of them again. And there's been all kinds of times when we've 
thought about pushing things like, you know, the, and in fact, I part of the reason I think it'd be cool to redo uh, Cat Dog now is that because the world's not getting along with itself, Cat Dog's yeah. kind of the perfect emblem for that. So, um, and, you know, the idea of having a Northern and Southern Ireland version of Cat Dog or, the, you know, black and white Cat Dog, all that kind of stuff. And in fact, you know, part of the inspiration for Cat Dog was the movie, The Defiant Ones, which is a, you know, black man chained to a white racist having to escape from the chain gang together and yeah. hating each other, but getting along. So I've always liked that idea of like, you know, these opposites attached that have to get through life together. And it's, um, uh, so, the, so the music, I only say that because the music kind of did come from my sort of roots in, in folk and country and, and blues. Always yeah. Like, but yeah, it's from the very beginning, that was part of it. Um, and then that song, the song, even the song itself came from that, you know, it's really, it reminds, it has always reminded me of those kind of story songs that are come from country music, you know, the, you know, the uh, stuff like Ringo and uh, uh, Scarecrow was an old song from like Disney was on like a story song that's like a country yeah. song. It has a, you know, or even Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone, those kinds of songs that have lots of lyrics and we did a really long version of the cat dog theme once that has more and more verses, you know, just because I like the idea of having this really long song that really tells a story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of what it is. Beautiful. Um, before I ask the last question, uh, I didn't just, I, this came up during the gym lane. I don't know if you've ever met him, but he was the composer for Hey Arnold. Yeah, uh, I know. Him. I've met him. I think I've met him, but I totally know who he is. Okay, yes. Yeah, so we were talking music, and, and I have to preface this with I'm very ignorant with music. I listen to music, but I listen to a lot of the same stuff, and I'm, I'm just now starting to branch out to a whole bunch of different stuff. But there's this guy I, I was watching, and, and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the show, but have you ever seen Luke Cage, the show on Netflix? Yeah, I've never, I know, I've heard of it, but I've never seen it. Yeah. So they did, this, they did something really cool. Uh, I think it was during the second season where every episode was like you could get the feel and the vibe from the episode from whatever musical guest they had on. Like it was shot in a R and B, like a, like a music bar or a, like a blues, like an old school music venue, right? It's a very small club, very intimate. In each episode, they would put a artist on there and then yeah. their feel, their vibe, the way they would do, whether it was R and B funk, whether it was, you know, hip hop or blues, yeah. it would coincide with the episode and the feel and what the direction that we were going right and there's this guy i'm pretty sure you've heard of him but chris stone kingfish ingram have you ever heard of this yeah, man yeah. Yeah. dude when i heard him i'll put a spell on you when he did the cover for that song like this man's like 19 at the time sounds like bb yeah. king just reincarnated yeah. like, i like i got you can't see it now but i got goosebumps just thinking about yeah. this this man is one of like the most i don't know what, i don't want to say like probably the most that I listened to as far as music goes as of late. And before that, I never really listened to blues. I didn't, you know, I, I grew up with R&B and hip hop and funk and, 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 you know, heavy metal and all this different shit, right? So all these different genres, but I never really got into blues because it was just very, very slow. And it wasn't until I saw him, I heard him before I saw him because I was in the kitchen and I'm like, holy shit, who is this dude? And I look over, I'm like, damn, he's young as shit to be sounding like this. I mean, he sounds like he's yeah. 60, 70, 80 years old. And anytime like blues come up, I got to tell everybody about this guy. He's just a phenomenal artist. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I, on this show I've been working on, we've been doing, um, I've been working with a couple different uh, collaborators on music. You know, I usually write, I usually do demos that are all me. And then I work with a producer to kind of do the fully blown out version of it. But yeah. Um, one of the people I've been working on is this guy, Andy Paley, who did a lot of the SpongeBob songs and he wrote Best Day Ever with Tom Kenny and stuff like yeah. that. And he worked with like Brian, Will, uh, Brian Wilson and all kinds of, he's got this amazing resume of people he worked with, but he's going to work with me on this new thing I'm working on too. So, yeah. and, and the thing that was really cool about the stuff we've done the past couple of years is that it's, um, you know, it's this show where they travel around the world. So we did songs in genres you know, all around the world, from yeah. Scandinavia to Africa, you know, all around for Africa to like South America and stuff like that. So it was really, a, it was a cool thing, a cool challenge, but also just super fun to write songs in different styles and, and bring them to life, you know, through uh, production and stuff. So it's really, it's really super fun, you know? Uh, yeah. Um, last question, you kind of uh, alluded to, or not alluded, you came out and said exactly, you know, where you, where you pulled inspiration from cat dog around, but I thought this one was funny nonetheless, because it's the last question and we literally just talked about it. Uh, Dylan wants to know, 
Were you inspired at all to make Cat Dog by the gag from Porky and Wacky Land? You know, I, this is really weird. I, I, I was yes, mm -hmm. but I, I, I had seen it. In fact, you know, back way back in the day, I worked in before I started actually figuring out what I wanted to do. Um, well, I wanted to be, I basically wanted to be a starving artist is what I wanted to do. And I was really busy. <laughs> doing, a really, doing a really good job at that. But I was also working as a manager in the movie theater and we showed, we, I worked in this repertory theater in Chicago where we programmed the theater and stuff like that. And we actually showed that cartoon, the Clampett cartoon. Yeah. And then I completely forgot about it. I literally forgot about it completely until after, um, after I was working on Cat Dog, and I realized, oh my God, yeah, I, I did, did see that. Because uh, have you seen it? You know, there's a, he, it just comes on screen for a second. It's a, this is the first I've ever heard about it. Yeah, yeah. He comes, he, this Cat Dog, it's, it's the same, you know, Porky goes to this crazy uh, land that's kind of like heaven, but it's just full of all kinds of surreal stuff. It's just super surreal. And then in the middle of this, is this kind of weird tornado that comes through and then it stops for a second and it's a cat dog and then it spins off again. And goes off. So it's like on screen for like seconds. And I completely forgot that I'd seen it. And then later I went like, oh my God, I do remember that. And I, yeah, I was certainly influenced by that. I was actually, the thing that was much more immediately influencing me in terms of two people connected is that thing Defiant Ones, but there was also a couple other really grade Z sort of B movies there's one called The Thing with Two Heads. It's Rosie Greer connected to uh, Ray Milland. It's hilarious. Like if you ever want to see a really hilariously bad movie, that's one of the inspirations for Cat Dog. It's this because it's like these two guys who have one gets you know his head grafted onto another guy's shoulder, but the <laughs> the way that they show it is just so hilarious because basically it's just him standing behind him, you know, like his head on his shoulder, <laughs> and and then there's other stuff where like. In long shots, they have like a fake head. So there's one yeah. shot where one of them is driving a motorcycle and this head is flapping on the, you know, <laughs> it's really funny. But they both, you know, I always thought with Defiant Ones, Defiant Ones is this real message movie, you know? Yeah. Like, um, and I always thought of Cat, from the very beginning, I thought of Cat Dog as being kind of a comic version of that, that somehow, you know, this these characters that really in real life would not be hanging around with each other or forced to be together and go through life together. And, you know, in all the conflict that that, you know that uh, conjures up, and that, you know they have they are against the world, but they are also against themselves, and it's just kind of a metaphor for all that. So, oh uh, yeah. So that's what I think. Yeah. But no, good call, good call. And I and I, but I didn't. Uh, you know, I later I felt like oh people are going to really think that I ripped off Bob Clampett, but I, I really it was I guess I did, but not intentionally. Basically. <laughs> He's gone anyways, man. I don't think he's going to have any complaints. If anything, life imitates art and art imitates life. So it's yeah. cyclical. Everything comes back around. Everything, you know, is, is everything should inspire somebody else because okay. you know, this podcast has said it a couple different times. So I apologize for the people that have heard it, but this podcast came out of COVID when they sent us all home last year in the restaurant industry, yeah. you, there's nothing worse being a creative person and having something to say and nobody saying it to, or yeah. nobody saying it nobody's to say it to excuse me you know so i started this little this little cooking thing it's called the vanilla gorilla kitchen where i show everybody what i've learned since i was 12 years old when i first picked up my first knife my pan and all that shit so from that to culinary school to every chef i've ever worked for because there's a lot of stuff you can't read in a book there's a lot of stuff you can't see on tv you got to physically fuck up multiple times in order to figure out like oh shit i should not add this to this to this because oh, oh shit the kitchen's on fire right so i try and, and i have a good time it's the same thing with this podcast i'm sitting there talking i'm answering questions uh, i'm showing people techniques and all this other shit because there's one thing that i don't think people do enough and it's, it's cook at home and yeah. You don't cook enough at home because, you know, everybody's too busy. Everybody got to do this, got to do that, got to do this. And it brings everybody in because the first thing we connect on is either food, music, movies, TV shows, cartoons you worked on, you know, yeah. so it's an easy thing to do. But a lot of people don't like to do it because they don't want to fuck up. They don't want to burn something. They don't want somebody to taste something that's nasty. Right. So between that and then, you know, Kobe Bryant dying and then hearing a song by Joyner Lucas and the guy was like, give people their roses while they're still here. Right. It yeah. resonated right here. And yeah. that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to reach out to people like you, everybody yeah. that I've had on that that I that were so influential, that were so big for me as a little kid. And even now as an adult, man, you guys were huge. You guys gave me something that was fun 
to laugh at, to, to, to just sit there and decompress, to talk with my friends. I mean, there was so much shit that we'd talk about. Oh, do you see what they did on Cat Dog? Do you see what they did on Hey Arnold? Do you see what they did on the Ed Boys? Do you see what they did on Jack this, that, that, and the other? Yeah. You guys gave us shit to talk about. You guys gave us shit to look forward to, man. And for a lot of people, I'm sure you hear it all the time, a lot of these kids have some rough goes in life, right? The only thing that they could look forward to was seeing what cat and dog were up to that day. They made, you guys made a shitty situation to a positive situation for somebody out there, man. And that's why I do this. I do this because I want people to know what you look like just as much as they know what cat and dog fuse together, even though we don't know what it looks like when they shit together. We want to know just what you look like just as much as cat dog, man. So that's why I do it. And I can't thank you enough for coming on here, man. Peter, I really appreciate it. I'm, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it because this is something I really, I really enjoyed doing, man. Um, is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to tell the fans, man? I mean, this is your chance to to to, to really take a bow, Peter. This is for you. Well, not really, not really. The only thing I would say is uh, to people that liked it, I'm very grateful and I'm really happy that people watched it. It's great to meet you, and it was great to hear some questions, and I, I love it. You know, I like interacting with uh, people about it always. It's a, it's always a pleasure. And so it's really funny because it, it comes up at the strangest times you never know like uh i've lost the ability to know what age group will know about it too because sometimes sometimes it would be gaps and then other like somebody who's a really young kid completely knows about it because it's on because it's on now but other other you know and then other other kids are going, oh i must have been too old at the time it's like no but then this must have missed me but other people are like no i saw it yesterday you know what i mean so it's just a funny it's a funny way to uh to have it acknowledged after all these years that you know people bring it up and talked about and was trending on you know it's just kind of cool it's like a cool thing that keeps giving it's very satisfying to me and it's great to talk about it so i love it yeah. well i got to imagine that you're going to have a lot more requests to do interviews after this game drops because there's going to be like a whole bunch of people be like oh shit i forgot about how great cat dog was mm -hmm. and i know that's probably one of the first couple characters i'm going to use when this game drops i'm going to beat the cool. shit out of everybody with cat dog so yeah cool. you know, i was actually kind of very was very happy to see that they whoever made it um really paid attention to stuff we'd done in episodes like there's a there's a, a function where dog gets pumped up like a muscle bound guy. And we did that in this show called Pumped. So I looked at it, I was like, wow, they they didn't just use cat dog. They actually looked at the episodes and figured out ways to use cat dog in a good, smart way. So it's you know cool. why, right? Why? Because there's people like me that love your work that are grown yeah, up, have that's grown good. up jobs now. That's why you that's got that's true. That's true. running the that's ship. True. So that's why that I was gonna, I'm just telling you, you can go the other way. Like they, you like you realize there's sometimes when people are doing stuff and they like they don't really are not really aware of what the source is. You know what I mean? But there, there are other times you go like, no, this whoever's working on this thing knows what's going gets it. You know, so it's cool. It's good to see. And we're glad that it does, man. Uh, like I said, thank you again for doing this. Uh, he's been Peter. I've been Julian. This has been the What's in My Head podcast, and this has been another piece of your childhood. Good night. Yeah, bye-bye.